All right. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the Cleveland R user group. Today, we're glad to have Matt Dupree. Uh, he's got a, a, a wide background in different areas, philosophy, web development, and uh, data science. And he's currently developing DataChimp. It's a tool to help data scientists analyze data fa faster. And today he's going to talk about all about metaprogramming in R. So take it away, Matt. Happy to have you here. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, and let me share my screen. It's a metaprogramming. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, full screen. Okay. So let me make sure I can see this. There we go. Okay, great. So, uh, who here has seen Inception? This is a little bit like, um, actually, it's a little silly to ask that on a Zoom call. Last time I gave this in person, so it's not like I can see people raising. Oh, wait a minute. There is there is that feature. Okay, I see one person. I see thumbs up. Okay, another thumbs up. Uh, okay, so I see three people, like what, about a 10, four. Uh, but, yeah. So it seems like it seems like people have seen it. That's good. There's there's, there's a kind of an NFT. Oh wait, hold on. Uh, somebody's asking. I'm breaking up. Um, yeah, the audio. It is breaking up before, like it wasn't before. So maybe you switch back to the computer. Um, okay. Let me switch back. How how's it sound now? Good. Good. Good? Okay. Usually people complain about the headphones and not like the opposite. So that, that's interesting. Okay. Here we are. So lots of people have seen Inception. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. And um it's uh, you know, even though it's I think it's a good movie, a lot of people liked it. A lot of people also felt like it was very uh kind of meta like not really accessible. You've got these like dreams inside of dreams inside of dreams. You're like, oh, what's really going on? Um, and, and you know, in my experience, metaprogramming can kind of feel like inception in this regard. Like it's, it's like, it's hard to understand. There's, you know, people don't feel like it's super accessible. Um, and, and the kind of the goal of this talk is to make metaprogramming feel less like that, to make it feel less kind of inaccessible um, and to make it feel uh, you know, more more awesome and, and something that um, that actually seems useful um, and something that's understandable. Uh, so so yeah, that's the goal of the talk. Uh, it's an intro to metaprogramming in R. Uh, here's kind of the quick agenda. First, we're going to talk about why we should even care about metaprogramming. Uh, so we're going to kind of just motivate interest in in metaprogramming as a tool. We're going to talk about how it works in R, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how I got interested in metaprogramming in R. Uh, so that's the that's the agenda. So let's start with why. Oh, by the way, um, if anybody wants to interrupt, uh, I would love that. Uh, it makes it feel a little more uh, human and less like we're sitting on a Zoom call. So if, uh, don't feel like you're going inter to interrupt my flow or anything like that. It's way more interesting if people just jump in and ask questions. Um, I'll be trying to monitor the chat as well. But I get excited, so I might miss it. So you might have to unmute yourself. Or maybe uh, maybe John can help us out. Uh, well, somebody did ask earlier what area of philosophy you studied. So if you want to, uh... oh yeah, Tom, yeah, I saw that. Okay, so so yeah, I was really interested in ethics and epistemology. Um, I think people know what ethics is. Epistemology is like actually it's related to Inception. Uh, so one of the uh, spoiler alert: um, the movie ends with this question of like whether the main character is in a dream or not. And um, this question was famously posed by uh, Rene Descartes in the 17th century. Uh, like he, he wondered whether you could know for sure whether you were dreaming or not. Like he was looking for this like solid foundation of knowledge. Um, and uh, people have been kind of wondering about this ever since. Like what, how do we, oh, do we just become best friends? Moral epistemology was my jam. Hey, moral epistemology is cool. Yeah, um, anyway, I, I won't ramble too much about that, but yeah, theory of knowledge, like how can we know what we know? That sort, that, those sorts of questions are the things I was interested in. Um, cool that Tom, there's some, there's some overlap there. Uh, all right, cool. So 
uh, quick kind of uh, definition of, um, of metaprogramming. You know, metaprogramming is about programs that understand or modify programs. So that's like the meta part, right? Um, and um, I, uh, you know, as a way of kind of motivating how useful metaprogramming is, um, I want to kind of show how ours metaprogramming capabilities um, enables it to provide a data wrangling DSL that's better than pandas. Um, I don't know. I don't know how many like Python people are here, so I don't want to like presumably not that many. In case there are a few, I'm like I'm half trolling here, okay? But but I do think that there's. So I don't want to like you know I'm not trying to start a flame war, but I do think that there are, are real uh, benefits that DeepIR has over pandas that are um, powered by meta programming. And I won't go as far to say that it's better than pandas full stop, but there are some advantages. I will I will make that claim. So let's look at some examples. So here is a, um, uh, this is this is like a filter um, statement in pandas. Okay, you have to call it, yeah, like, <laughs> I see John is squinting. He's like, this seems terrible. Uh, so, so yeah, this is like, if you, if you want to filter, um, you know, something in, in, in a, a pandas data frame, you call this query method and you pass in a string. Um, we know that in R, we get to just call this filter function and we get to skip the quotes for the string. We can just refer to the columns um, and, and, and filter things out that way. Uh, so that's, I, you know, I, I think that the R way is better here. It's a little bit more ergonomic. You're not worrying about strings. Um, it's just one less piece of syntax to worry about. Um, and this is this is powered partially by metaprogramming. Maybe you're not that impressed. Let's look at some other examples. Um, here is how you um, basically uh, wind up with uh, distinct uh, values in, in a pandas data frame. Um, again, you're, um, you're having to do two things here. You're subsetting into the data frame. And then you're um, using the string syntax to refer to a particular column. In R, we get to do this thing on the right. I think it's this is nicer. Again, we don't have the string stuff, and we're not like worrying about the subsetting. Um, so there's kind of two pieces of syntax that we don't have to worry about there. Um, uh, this this like you know the R's way really starts to shine with this example. So this is how you create a new column in 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 uh, pandas um, where you know you're subtracting B from A and assigning it to C. So now you're multiple times you're subsetting and multiple times you're using the string syntax to refer to the columns. In R, we get to do something really nice. We just say mutate C equals A minus B. Um, and so there, you know, hopefully you're like feeling a little more convinced. I think there's one more example, um, you know, like, oh, this is actually kind of nice. Like this, it's, it's a little more ergonomic. Um, oh yeah, so one more example. Um, here we're grouping by one column and computing a mean. Um, and you know, in R, I, again, I think it looks nicer. We're dropping the strings. We're dropping these like these kind of dictionaries that we have to create in line, and we can just refer to uh, to things and call functions. So we're not learning special syntax or special ways of working with these data frames. We're just kind of calling functions and referring to columns, which is really nice. Um, uh, so uh, okay, so that's that's just like. Uh, some some would say maybe that's just a nice to have, but I think it's pretty nice to have. But let's let's like let's have a uh, make the the um, example you know a little more interesting or really kind of show off the power of metaprogramming in R. So um, so many of you probably know. Um, well, okay, yeah, sorry. So there's before I say that uh, the pipe operator is also powered by metaprogramming. We I think a lot of us really like the pipe operator, and so that and that's something that is just not available in Python. There's not something quite like it. Um, and so that's that's another cool thing that metaprogramming enables. Um, oh, this is, um, uh, wait a minute. These slides feel out of order. Oh, I okay, I, I know what's going on here. So um, this is this is more for Python people. Some, so for some people, I, I was shocked to learn this, that the pipe is controversial in Python land. People don't necessarily like using the pipe, um, and so and this is this is just somebody who wrote a, a book called Effective Pandas, and some people. So it's like the pipe is kind of this polarizing thing. Um, I don't know. Actually, let's stop for a second. Does anybody not like the pipe? Can somebody raise their hand if they don't like the pipe or say something in chat? Ooh, we have we have a pipe non-believer here. Oh, we have two people. Wow, fascinating. That's interesting. Oh man, I'm just I'm just laughing at the people who are not liking the pipes. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
as oh, it's okay. how to explain I himself. Like package code. I, I see that. I see that. Okay, so there's a few people who are not necessarily fans. Um, all right, well, we can talk about it more after, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and motivate the pipe a little bit here. Um, at least it's you know, and kind of suggest that at least it's useful sometimes. And um, this is all in the service of motivating why metaprogramming matters and why it's useful. So here is um, what some, uh, this is like some Python code for wrangling some data. Um, they're, they're really like, you can see, the, okay, so you're supposed to squint here. It's not supposed to be particularly readable. Um, all they're trying to do is get to this last line of code and they're just creating a bunch of intermediate variables. They don't really care about the name of these things. Like they're just like, you know, <clears throat> um, they're just trying to get to the bottom and because they don't have the pipe, there's just a lot of kind of mess in the middle. Um, and so the, this is the same code using the pipe method in, uh, in pandas, um, which get, is kind of the closest thing that they have to the pipe operator. Uh, so the key lines are here. Um, again, this is not meant to be particularly readable, but, um, but you know, that the, the code um, winds up being, I think, quite a bit cleaner compared to what we saw before. Um, you know, maybe some people are like, no, it's not. That's why I don't like pipes. Whatever. We can't, we can't get into it um, now, maybe, maybe at the end. But, um, but you know, uh, the, the pipe operator in R is really better than this kind of dot pipe method on the, dan uh, the pandas data frame. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, I, th I think, mm, I, I don't think I need to say too much about why. Oh, hold on. Did somebody... Brian posted a link to the pipe. Oh, okay. What is the triangle symbol? Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is this is just the new pipe um, operator in, in R. Like, so the pipe, yeah, it's the pipe. So uh, before you, in order to use the pipe, you had to import a package. Um, now it's just in base R um, because it's it's become like really kind of central to the way a, a lot of people work in R. Um, there's actually a- I guess I use R only in the terminal. And so I'm not familiar with this. Unicode symbol for it is that I mean I, I am completely familiar with the new base R. Oh, oh course, I see. I've never seen this triangle before. This is yeah. This is um. This is something called a font ligature. Uh. So the, yeah, a Alec has it. So um. So yeah. What um. This is a really cool font that um. Uh. Uses something called ligatures. So the, basically, the idea is when you have two characters that have a special meaning in a programming language. Ligatures fuse those into a single character. Uh, and the idea is that it's faster to process the code uh, because you're not processing two characters, you're processing one. That's like the, the, the theory anyway. Plus it just looks cool. So, so yeah, there's something, there's a font called Fira Code, but there are a lot of other fonts that use these ligatures. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's, what, that's what that is. Does that answer your question? It does. So it's really two symbols, the, uh, yes. the standard R pipe symbol. Okay. That I understand. Yeah, that's right. It's really two symbols. It's um, here. We can, let's, uh, uh, we can just quickly look at this. So really it's, um, we're going to need uh, this term yeah, later yeah. anyway. I, I understand it. So you don't have to, yeah, I understand. Yeah. That. Got it. Great. Uh, okay. So let's pop back over and resume. So um, I actually ran into Wes McKinney, the guy, the guy who kind of created pandas at a conference, at an R conference in New York a couple months ago. And I asked him if there was anything he didn't like about pandas. And he was like, yeah, I, you know, wish we could do pipes, but we don't have non-standard evaluation in Python, which is like this metaprogramming thing. Um, so if you don't like pipes, maybe maybe you're maybe because you're like more Pythonic in your way of thinking. At least Wes McKinney is like, ah, he's he's in favor of the pipe. Fun fact. Um, okay, so that's pipes, another kind of metaprogramming powered thing. Uh, let's do one more example, um, kind of cool, you know, language thing that's powered by metaprogramming. Um, a lot of you probably know that you can work with uh, Postgres connections um, as if they are data frames that are just in memory. Um, and so that that was kind of the tweak that we made here, right? We have a data frame. Then you know now it's like oh we could just pretend that we have this Postgres connection that kind of adds a data frame keep the rest of our you know dpy our code the same um, and this is this is actually powered by metaprogramming too this is really nice I think like a really cool feature that we used a lot um, at my last job at Heap and you know one thing that's really interesting is if you add a lot like a mutate line like this 
where you're creating a new column and you have this if else thing, what happens is that this gets translated into a case when statement in, in the SQL that's generated from this code. And this like is powered by metaprogramming. Um, and I think it's really nice. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty cool feature. Um, oh, and then another neat thing um, that you get when you're working with, you know, SQL databases with dbplyr that again is powered by metaprogramming is, um, so here we're grouping by a column and then computing a mean by another column. If we wanna call a Postgres user defined function on the second column, this function, you know, is not going to be defined in the local environment. Uh, dbplyr will automatically translate this into a, a SQL statement that uses that UDF. Um, and so it recognizes that Postgres underbar UDF is not defined in the R environment and then translates that into a SQL UDF invocation when it generates a SQL. I think it's super cool. Um, so hopefully at this point, the why the question has been answered. You're like, you're feeling like, okay, yeah, metaprogramming seems pretty cool. I could see why it's maybe worth um, spending some time, um, you know, digging deep into understanding how it works. Um, maybe Can you're I even ask, feeling, go ahead. Can I, um, just a quick question after all of these examples that you showed, what is then the difference between metaprogramming and like functional programming or tidy evaluation? Can you get into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Tidy evaluation is, uh, you know, part and parcel with, with metaprogramming. Like it's, it's a way of doing metaprogramming for sure. Um, functional programming, I would say, um, you know, with functional programming, you're, you know, you can, you, you, you know, you can do some neat things and maybe some of those things kind of feel like metaprogramming, but fundamentally you're not analyzing the source code with code when you're doing functional programming. Um, and that's, I, that, that I would say is like the, the differentiator between metaprogramming and functional programming. Does that make sense? Thanks, yeah. Great, thanks so much for asking the question. This is fun, everybody keep doing it. Uh, all right, so uh, maybe you're even feeling like really excited about metaprogramming now and you wanna like, I, there's this saying that, you know, when you first learn a tool, you tend to overuse it because like you have this hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, maybe it's a bad joke, but may maybe you're feeling like that. That would be that would be great. That'd be a win. Uh, you'll you know um, as long as you're interested in learning more about metaprogramming, because that's what the rest of the thing is about. Um, okay, so how does it work? Uh, let's look at you know one of these first examples. This kind of um, you know query um, uh, you know uh, pandas way of doing it versus the filter uh, R way of doing it. Um, so let's let's kind of break down how this works. So um, if we weren't going to do any metaprogramming. Like if we we're just going to do normal R stuff, um, you know, we could create a data frame, and then if we wanted to sum up, you know, um, the, the the values in each of these columns, this, you know, we could do it this way, uh, where we do, you know, DF dollar sign X plus DF dollar sign Y, DF dollar sign Z. So we're we're kind of doing the subsetting thing, right? Um, and that's that's without metaprogramming. If we're going to do this with metaprogramming, we can actually use a function called with, um, and we pass in the data frame, and then in the second argument to this function, we can just refer to X, Y, and Z without the subsetting. Um, this is this is like this is powered by metaprogramming, right? So this is like this is a very basic thing that we're going to peek under the hood into. Um, so how does this with function work? That's what we're going to talk about. Just to kind of get at how metaprogramming works now. Quick quiz. How many lines of code do you think it takes to implement with a function like with in in R? Any guesses? Three, it's a good guess. Any other guesses? 20, oh, I like it. Any other guesses? All right, two, two is good. Uh, just the R code, just the R code. No, no, no C++. 11, all right, I like it. Okay, John, you're off by one, which is uh, for, you know, programming is might as well be good enough. Like it's, you did it. Uh, it's just two lines of code. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about what each of these lines of code does. Um, yeah, 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 that's right. I'm quoting and then evaluate. That's kind of what we're doing here. Yeah, exactly. So isn't, let's talk. Let's, isn't within base uh, though? This is not. It, 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 it is in base. Um, but if you, so, different function than with, right? What's that? This is not uh, the R's with. This is some other function. It's, yeah, yeah, so uh, Hadley Wickham like breaks down with in advanced R. And so this is like basically his like, he's like, this is very similar to what, you know, is going on in base R. 
um, in, in, with their with function. Um, so yeah, um, I'll, I'll reference the chapter that this is from um, a little later, but yeah, th this is just kind of lifting from there. Well, I, I know Hadley's book pr pretty well, so I, I, I know. Oh, great. I'm just pointing out that this isn't ours with function. It's a different one. Fair enough, yeah, f fair enough, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about these these two lines. Um, so this first line, um, we're using this in quo uh, function here. And, uh, oh, look at that. Base ours does both in one line. John just looked it up. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, just um, explain the evaluation of the substitution into two lines at the, with this yep. example. Yep, that makes sense, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this enclosure thing. Um, so the name is a, basically a combination of quoting and closure uh, because a closure both quotes the expression and encloses the environment. Uh, so this is, um, you know, this is kind of the, the key to understanding this first line of code here. And there's two pieces to it. There's this idea of quoting an expression. Um, and, you know, what does that mean? Um, I, I, I like to try and use kind of an English language analogy here. So if you say to somebody, add one to X, like that's a command that they may go do if they're nice. Um, that's, that's kind of one way of interacting with somebody. Another, another thing you could say is you could say, oh, she said, add one to X. And in that case, you're not giving a command. You're, you're just, you're telling somebody what somebody else said. So you're kind of quoting the command, right? And this is, this is kind of similar to what, how quoting works in R, where you're not telling R to do the thing anymore. You're capturing the command. You're, you're, you're saying, oh, like I, I said this, and you're kind of putting quotes around it. Um, and so like to kind of make that con concrete, let's say, you know, you have X is equal to 42. Um, if you do, you know, X plus one in the REPL, you're going to get 43. And that lines up with the like add one to X part. Um, if you wrap that X plus one in a quote, function call, you're just, the, the REPL will just return X plus one. It's not going to actually evaluate that thing um, because it's, you've quoted it. You're just, you're not saying do it. You're like, this is, no, no, this is the thing that I said. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we mean by quoting. <clears throat> and then let's talk about this enclosing the environment part. So, um, and it's related to quoting. So imagine, you know, that we said, um, you know, we, we have this quote, we, uh, you know, we said, uh, she said, add one to X and then some time passes. And then uh, we, we want to say, okay, now do what she said. Do the thing that we kind of quoted earlier. Um, there's this problem where it's like, oh, I can't do the thing that was said earlier because I forgot what X is. Um, and this is like what, you know, environments are about in, in, in kind of closures. So these environments, uh, they map variables to values and they solve this problem. So um, going back to the example, you know, if we say, uh, you know, she said add one to X and sometime passes and say, now do what she said. Um, with, with the environment, we can say, oh yeah, it's 43 because X was 42. I remember what X was. This is like kind of what environments do, right? Um, and so when we call this in quote function, we're capturing both the code or the expression in the environment um, in which that expression was originally formed. And then that, that, that kind of takes us to the next step, uh, just the next line. And then, so this isn't, you're, this is definitely not base R's implementation, right? Because this is like a tidy evaluation way of doing it. Um, but this is just, this is how Hadley talks about it in the book. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, the next thing that you do is you call this a valid tidy function and, um, you know, you're passing in this, this enclosure, this combination of the expression and the environment. And um, that's the thing that kind of corresponds to the now do what she said, you know, um, piece of this kind of English language analogy that we have. And, um, you know, there's this, uh, I don't, Love this next slide. So um, I just skipped that. So the second parameter um, where you're passing in the data frame, basically what that says is now do what you said and add the vectors from this data frame, the second, you know, the, the second uh, parameter to the environment. And that's how with works, because you've captured the expression, you've captured the surrounding environment, and you've added the data frame to uh, to that environment in which X, Y, and Z is evaluated. Um, so that's that's kind of, that's how, you know, um, some of this metaprogramming stuff works. Um, a lot of the deep, you know, deep IR stuff that we saw is using kind of these, these kinds of techniques of quoting and um, capturing environments. Uh, okay, this is kind of just summing up uh, what we did. Let's look, any questions here? Any questions or thoughts? 
How's the English language analogy working? I've had, this is the third time I've given this talk and it's been mixed. So if anybody's confused, I'd love to know and, and try again. Or if some, some people, sometimes people in the audience are better explaining it to me. So would, would, love, would love some participation if anybody's confused or wants to offer an alternative way of thinking about it in case it fits better for folks. No? Okay. Yeah, I thought it was a nice uh, this explanation. Um, oh, good. Well, thanks. I, uh, so I guess it's like uh, two, miss, two, two hits and one miss in terms of the usefulness of the English language analogy. Uh, okay. So um, let's talk about how another thing works um, with, with metaprogramming. So there, uh, you know, I mentioned this, um, you know, this kind of dbplyr functionality where you get to work with a database connection as if it's a data frame in memory. Um, and so, the, you know, you remember this example where we're calling mutate and we're adding this new column. We have this if else statement um, and then it gets translated into SQL. So how does this work? Um, let's, let me pull up the, uh, the REPL for this. So um, a cool way of a cool way of looking at this stuff is with a library called Lobster, um, and um, what you can do with Lobster is you can actually um, you can look at any code that's written in you know in R Studio or wherever the terminal. Um, you can represent this code as a tree. Um, and with what, what Lobster lets you do is it lets you see that tree. So, um, you know, here's what the tree looks like for an expression like this. Can everybody see this okay? Everybody see this? Great. Yeah, that's good, so, yeah. so you can cap, so you can, you know, um, when you type in code like this, um, using kind of R's quoting functionality, um, you can, you can kind of grab this, not evaluate it, and then look at the tree um, that, that, that kind of represents this code. Um, and then you can modify the tree. Uh, so, so, uh, an example of that, if we, if we use instead of ASP quote, um, you know, and we, we subset into the second thing. Um, so the second thing in this tree is true. Um, you know, the first, the first thing is maybe if, uh, yeah. Um, and so you can, you can kind of examine the different parts of the, um, of the tree and you can actually modify the tree. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of what powers the SQL translation stuff is you can, you can inspect the tree, walk the tree and kind of use the, the, the code tree to generate SQL. Um, and so that's what's going on when we, when we get to write that mutate, you know, column one equals if blah, 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 that, that's just standard R code and dbplyr gets to quote that, look at the tree and then parse that tree to translate it into SQL. Um, so that's like, that's another kind of piece of how some of this stuff works. Um, little, little, little hand wavy, but, um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully clear. Um, let's switch back to this. Uh, so all of this, um, I, I, any questions here? Just quick clarification. The quote function is from the lobster package? No, that one I think oh, okay. is just based on. I think that one's just based on. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, just based on. Uh, okay, so uh, so all of this, like not all of it, but a lot of this is um, I just got from the advanced R book. Uh, in particular, chapter eighteen is really great. Um, you know, they they walk through um, you know the with example and some other ones. They actually have some really great. Um, you can see this here. They have like some kind of code that you can lift for walking through the abstract syntax tree of code. Um, with recursive functions. So if you wanted to do something like generate SQL from R code, you know, you could lift a piece, uh, uh, the pieces of code from, from this section here. Um, and uh, yeah, so that recommend the book and this chapter in particular is, is pretty uh, related to what we've been talking about so far. Uh, okay, so now we'll get a little bit into my kind of metaprogramming journey and why, you know, I started, um, you know, thinking about this so much. Uh, so um, my, my journey is a little bit that people, people have seen Lord of the Rings, right? Um, this is, it's more famous than Inception. Has anybody not seen Lord of the Rings? Can I get a thumbs down from people who have not seen Lord of the Rings? Not seen it. Ah, oh, it hurts. Listen, oh, well, you've read it. Then that's fine. That's fine. Um, you may, you may not even like the movie if you've read the books. 
Okay, well, um, so my journey feel, you know, in the, into metaprogramming feels a little bit like the first Lord of the Rings movie where um, you've read the books, so you'll get this. Um, they, uh, unless it doesn't, unless it's not real, like it wasn't in the books, but, but um, you know, Frodo, um, he, he thinks that he can just take the ring to Rivendell, like in the first movie. And then it, like, it'll be safe and like, he's done. You know, like his journey is over. It's like a, you know, and, and then, you know, Lord of the Rings would have been like an hour and a half long instead of a nine hour three movie saga. Um, and that's like kind of how the metaprogramming journey felt for me. Whereas like, I was just like doing this small thing, thought I would, you know, kind of do a small thing and be done with it. And it's turned into this kind of crazy saga. What's the small thing I was trying to do? I was trying to avoid this. Um, it's very simple. So we, um, at, at my last job, I, I worked at Heap on the data science team and we had a bunch of data in Snowflake. And it was very easy to forget to check the size of the data before you pulled it locally. So we were leveraging the, um, you know, dbplyr library to translate our dplyr code into Snowflake SQL. And so we could, you know, we could work with a lot of data. And then often we would pull a subset of that data locally to visualize it or kind of do some things locally. And I would often forget to check how big the data was before I tried to pull it locally. And so then like our studio would just explode and give me the bomb. And um, it was really annoying. And, and you know, the, some of the more experienced folks on the team, they just had got, I had just joined the data science team. They had gotten in the habit of just always checking the size. Like before you run collect, always check the size. And um, I'm like spoiled, I guess. I don't know. I was like, that's not good enough. Like, I don't want, I shouldn't have to. Um, yeah, data table is, yeah, it's it's an interesting, I did work with DRob. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so data table, we, why didn't we use data table? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, because of the but, database, the, because it, because you don't have a database in for interface. If you stuff everything into the database, you got to get out first before you get an R. Yeah. So you just right. use a DBI connector and then pull the data out. Sure. Yeah. I think, I think something like that was possible. Um, we just never, we never got around to it. Like, I think it was like fine for them to check the size of things and sample and kind of go from there. So I was like, all right, whatever. This is, that's, that's what they told me to do. Check, check the sizes of stuff first. And I said, that's not good enough. What I really want is, um, you know, let's say you have the Snowflake data frame, you do the mutation, you do the collect, um, you know, so like, oh, just run count um, all the time. And um, what I wanted was, what I didn't like about write, writing this little count call is you kind of, it interrupts your flow, right? Like you're, you're doing an analysis, you just want to like kind of move through things. You don't have to like stop your little pipeline, you know, move the cursor up and then like write this count call, check the result and then go back to what you're doing. So what I wanted was, I just want to be able to invoke a hotkey and get the count of the data frame or, or of the expression that is currently selected by my cursor, um, like by my, by my selection within RStudio. Um, so it's like not just the data frame, it's like the selection, the code itself, right? So I had to write, Code that like kind of played with the code that I that I had um, that I had written in a, in a data notebook, um, and this was kind of the start of the journey, right? So it's like, yeah, I just want to run Command Shift C and execute this function so that I can check to see how big things are. And so to do that, I used there's this really neat R library um, called Shortcuts that basically lets you bind um, functions to keystrokes or hotkeys. Um, and so this is what I used to kind of solve this problem. You know, I had, you know, shortcuts, a little bit, tiny, tiny bit of like metaprogramming. And then like, I was off to the races, like had what I needed. Um, then this other thing happened where I, you know, we were doing this analysis. We found this, you know, really kind of bombshell insight, got excited, shared it with folks. And then, um, you know, my boss, D-Rob was like, uh, hey, you know, did you use, you know, sessions, the sessions column in the Snowflake data table or the sessions under bar real column, which is like column number 40, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Snowflake uh, table. I was like, oh no, I used, I didn't use sessions under bar real. I, I didn't even know that existed. And so we, there's like this, turned out that the column that I used had a lot of missing values. There was like a data quality issue. And so we had to kind of do some backpedaling 
thankfully the insight like still stood up, but it was a scary, you know, hour or hour or so where we were like, ah, you know, maybe we just um, told told some folks some fake news. Um, and so, um, so that, you know, that happened and that kind of bothered me too, right? And so, and that got me thinking about metaprogramming again. Oh, this is like the Slack message, fake Slack message. So, and that got me thinking about a lot of other kind of mistakes that it's easy to make while we're doing analysis, like bad joins, maybe you're, you know, accidentally comparing small groups without realizing it, bugs in mutation code, you're writing like a regular expression or something, and, um, you know, your regular expression isn't quite correct, um, or, you know, there's data quality issues, like there's a lot of missing values, so there's a lot of things that can happen while you're, while you're analyzing data, and I started to feel like, Analyzing data was kind of like these, like this old chainsaw from the fifties. Like it's like very easy to cut your hand off with a chainsaw like this. There is no thought about like how can we make this really safe. It's just like no, 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 just make it so that it can cut. And that's kind of it feels like that. That's what we have as, as data, as data scientists and data practitioners with our data analysis tools. It's like can it cut the data? That's kind of all we have. We don't have a lot of safety. I started to think about what you know, how can we make analyzing data feels safer, kind of like the more modern chainsaw, where you like you kind of have to try a little hard to hurt yourself because you, you know, you've got to like, in order to use a more modern chainsaw, you're like, your hand has to be here to push this thing. And then this hand has to be down here to push this other thing. And then like, it'll go. And so it's like by design, like it's your hands are away from the blade. Um, and so how do we, how do we make our tools do that? And um, so this is, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm at the, at the tail end of the talk here. So I'll just, I'll just uh, quickly end by saying that this very small, like kind of annoyance with analyzing data turned into this bigger question, which turned into like a prototype and like a company, like this is, this is like what I'm doing. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like give you an ad here, but like, this is the metaprogramming journey. This is how it ends. And like, this is kind of the question, like how can we really lean into metaprogramming to make data analysis faster and safer? So that's where I'm at right now. That's the end of the talk. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for listening and for all the questions and interaction. It was fun. Uh, so that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. That was great. That was entertaining and informative. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks uh, for having me. I love I love speaking.